Hello and welcome to You've Seen It Before, TV Reviews of Connection to the Mind, and welcome back to my final installment in my review and reaction series to each and every episode of Season 3 of The Orville New Horizons. Uh, if you've never seen one of my uh, review and reaction episodes before, this is where I give my uh, brief overview of the latest episode of whichever episode, uh, episode of the series I happen to be reviewing. Um, I give my brief thoughts on uh, what worked, didn't work, my likes and dis dislikes, uh, as well as some analysis as to certain plot developments and character arcs that may seem familiar to you and where you may have seen them before. Just to get this out of the way, this will be a full spoiler and re review and reaction, so if you've not seen the latest episodes of uh, The Orville New Horizons, then I would suggest coming back when you have, because this will be full-on spoilers from here on out. I say episodes because uh, those keeping counts may notice that uh, there were 10 episodes in the season and I failed to do a review and reaction of episode 9 in the season because I was out of town last week. So this will be co uh, covering both uh, season 3 episode 9, uh, episode titled Domino, as well as season 3 episode 10 entitled Future Unknown. So without further ado, let's uh, do my brief uh, recap and thoughts on uh, episode 9 before I get into the main meat, which is episode 10. Um, yeah, so Domino, really, if I was going to boil this down, because really this is one of the more simpler uh, episodes of the season as far as, you know, plot-wise, because there's really three main story beats uh, to go with this, ep uh, with this episode, maybe four. So... Uh, mainly, uh, episode 9 is dealing with the fallout of Union's decision to uh, eject the, uh, Moklis from the Union, and because of this, uh, Moklis has now uh, aligned themselves with the Krill in the face of the Kalon threat, and they, uh, they believe that you know, because of this alliance, the Union will be even more vulnerable than it ever was. However, uh, you know, I think the timeline says a month or so after uh, that alliance is forged, uh, the Orville and a, alliance, a Union fleet is able <coughs> excuse me, to devise a weapon that uses the subspace link between all Kalons to essentially destroy them. It is, the, it is essentially the atomic bomb of, uh, of the Kalons, and it brings the Kalons to uh, their knees, essentially, uh, and they're forced into an armistice with the Union, and you know, basically say, hey, as long as we have this weapon, we're not going to use it, but you need to stay in your planet, and we can, we'll, have, we'll figure out a way to learn to coexist on here. Yeah, as long as you stay, you know, stay peaceful, we're not going to come near you anymore, and this weapon is our guarantee. Seems to be all well and good. However, a uh, rogue admiral, uh, played by Ted Danson in the Union, um, and manages to steal the weapon uh, and give it to the krill Mocklin Alliance because he knows that they will have no ethical compunctions about committing, you know, essentially genocide on this, uh, on the Kalon species. And uh, with that revelation, the Orville decides to, um, uh, is basically forced to uh, align themselves with the Kalon uh, in order to attack this uh, research facility where the, the Mocklin and the Krill have installed this weapon. And uh, while, you know, the crew of the Orville, you know, Kelly, uh, uh, Tala, um, uh, the Isaac, and Charlie, and um, uh, Kalon Primary go into the, uh, the facility to retrieve the weapon, where well, if all fails, destroy it. Um, the combined Union and Kalon fleet engage the combined Mocklin and Krill fleet, and so there's a giant space battle both above the planet and between the various fighters uh, above the uh, in the, in, in uh, the atmosphere above this facility. So while all that's going on, the uh, the infiltration team manages to locate the we uh, the weapon. However, it's building up power in order to launch the uh, uh, the wave. Uh, of energy that would destroy all of K all the Kalons uh, left in the galaxy, and there's essentially no time left to uh, deactivate it, or even possible way to deactivate it. So Charlie manages to figure out a way to um, to create an overload that will destroy it, but also pretty much the entire planet, thus saving the Kalon uh, species. However, she ends up sacrificing herself, 
in the process. Once everyone's back on the ship, Kalon Primary realizes, uh, asks the question, you know, why did Charlie sacrifice herself for us? And Kelly's like, you know, because it was her duty and, and it was the right thing to do, even though she really did not like you. Um, and that brings the Kalon to say, yeah, to reconsider their notions of, you know, maybe not all organics are bad. And that's basically how the episode, e the episode ends with a memorial service to Anson Charlie Burke. Um, so this episode, uh, when I saw it, I was like, man, this is a, quite the substantial battle uh, scene here. I didn't think they were going to be able to top the space battle scenes from uh, the two-part uh, Identity Part 2 from the second season, but they sure managed to do it. There's a lot of impressive action, and I think they earned that as well throughout the season. Um, I, uh, you know, really uh, the, don't really have any real complaints about this episode. It, it works as a logical progression um, from event to event, and I feel like they do earn the action as well as, you know, uh, earning... Uh, I feel like they, for the most part, land, made, uh, stuck the landing on Charlie's sacrifice and the ultimate redemption arc. However, I feel like, you know, the nine episodes in, and she wasn't really prominent in all those nine episodes, I feel like maybe they could have uh, worked a little bit more on uh, the shown the redemption arc a little bit more earlier in the season, because essentially, you know, one episode... She begrudgingly accepts uh, Isaac's uh, friendship, uh, uh, Isaac's, you know, assistance. Another episode, you know, with, uh, she, she essentially comes around to, uh, on, you know, Isaac being a decent uh, decent being and, you know, conclude that not all Kaylin are evil. And then one episode after that, she ends up sacrificing herself for, uh, for all of Kaylin kind. And I know that, you know, real time-wise, more time in, uh, in universe in the past, uh, more than that, but you know, episode-wise, it did seem slightly rushed. But nevertheless, uh, I think they most pretty much stuck the landing on that. And you know, uh, again, those space battles were fantastic as far as I go. Really shows that uh, improved budget of uh, that Hulu had been given to the season. And of course, the final battle has twinges of both. Uh, Star Wars The Force Awakens, especially because, you know, you could go back even further, you know, Death Star, but the fact that the facility is in, inside an entire planet, and the whole planet's going to go up when it, uh, when it goes, uh, more resembles Starkiller base, in my opinion, especially when they go through, you know, the little trench run, essentially, uh, with Gordon and, and, uh, and Lamar uh, going through that. Um, but also, you know, going back to a Star Trek uh, comparison, I'd say it also has tinges of uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, the Dominion War, specifically uh, what you leave behind, the final battle uh, over Cardassia, uh, where you have the uh, you have the battle between um, Jem'Hadar and the Cardassians and the alliance of the Federation, the Klingons, and the Romulans, uh, all that going on there. And, um, oh, and the Breen were on the other side, too. I can't forget them. But... Again, that's, uh, that is very much the feel that I got in this episode. I think it was very well done. So, I mean, those are my main thoughts on episode 9. I know that was kind of a rush job on that, but like I said, uh, you could, this one was much easier to boil down to its essentials, in my opinion. Um, and so now we get into the season finale of Dwarf New Horizons, episode 10, Future Unknown, where, um, again, there's really mainly two... Uh, the it, this is fairly easily boiled down to an A story and a B story. Well, A, B, and a B, A, uh, B part two or something. Because uh, the A story is um, the, the Orville is going towards a mining uh, colony that is right near a planet which was featured heavily in uh, season one where, um, you know, uh, the planet where uh, it's basically uh, a planet ruled by social media and people getting upvotes and downvotes and John almost got his brain fried uh, because of that. And the local that helped him, she was named Lucilla, and the Orville gets a signal from Lucilla, uh, which should not be possible because she you know, stole a, co a communicator uh, after that initial meeting. And she essentially requests asylum. She, de she decides, no, I can't live in this society anymore knowing what else is out there in the universe and she gets aboard and throughout the rest of the episode she's 
constantly struggling with, you know, as form as Kelly identifies it, a form of survivor's guilt because uh, she knows that she can't go back to the planet. She knows that, uh, I mean, she wants to bring back all this advanced technology, like, you know, repli matter synthesizer, the replicator, which can make all the things that can uh, cause, all, I mean, it's, you know, it helps so many problems on, uh, in, on Earth and the rest of the Union. Surely it can help for them. But, she, uh, but the law, obviously, you know, cultural contamination and bringing technology to the society isn't ready for it. She can't do that. And she's wrestling with this all throughout the episode. And finally, because of Kelly's, you know, steadfast uh, counseling of her, essentially, and being a, uh, a good friend to her, she basically comes around and realizes, no, I, uh, I have to come to terms with this, and it's going to be a long road, but no, I can get past this. I can find my way in this new universe I've set on this path. Um, and, you know, not a, uh, I mean, this is a good struggle to have, because obviously her desire is to help her planet but uh, in, but however, the way she wants to help it can't be done because of the ramifications that happen to other planets. Like Kelly shows her a simulation of a planet that essentially destroyed itself within five years after the Union gave them uh, all this advanced technology in the uh, in the hope that you know having this technology will help improve your society. Uh, it obviously didn't work. Um, and so the B plot is uh, really the main uh, the other main thrust of this episode, which. Isaac uh, proposes to Claire, and Claire accepts. Uh, Isaac was spurred by uh, uh, a ceremony where Bordas and Clyden uh, renew their wedding vows, essentially in the most mocking way possible. And uh, Isaac was moved to propose to Claire, and she accepts. And all of this, you know, preparing for the wedding, getting the way to go, and there's hijinks along the way. Hijink, uh, main hijink number one is, you know, uh, Isaac asks for a best man, and he initially asks Gordon to do it, uh, but then Bordas essentially hijacks the process and it makes himself the best man, and Isaac agrees. Uh, and it isn't only until the final, uh, the final bit of the of the ceremony when the toasts have held and Bordas is botching it just so terribly that uh, Isaac essentially gives the best man duties back to Gordon after the ceremony is done so he can give a proper toast. Um, and then shenanigan B is um, the when um, uh, Claire explains to Isaac, yes, we, I want to invite you know family and friends to this wedding. And Isaac completely misunderstands the situation when he invites, uh, you know, Kalon Primary to this. It's like, oh, well, this is interesting. Kind of how many, would you require all, uh, all units to show up? And, so, and, Kale, and I, Isaac Hobbs says, yes, that's acceptable. And then, of course, you know, 4,000 Kalon ships show up at the Orville's, in front of the Orville, and it has to go and say, you know, inform the rest of the, of the, of the sector that no, the Kalons are not launching another mass invasion of, of, of Union space. Uh, don't panic on that. So that was a fun bit. And so mainly the episode ends with, um, you know, Claire and Isaac, you know, Tying the knot, making their vows, and it's really, and really, kind of a low-key finale to this, which makes sense given the very action-heavy episode prior. Um, and, you know, Gordon sings, uh, takes the guitar and sings a lovely song. You know, "Welcome to the Human Race," um, and you know, the Orville's, you know, as they're singing, he fly, uh, is flying off into the uh, metaphorical sunset at this point, and uh, that's when the season ends. And Again, I love this episode because I feel like this is probably the most well-balanced uh, episode that we've had this season as far as you know, serious moments and uh, funny moments. Because I think in previous episodes this season, the humor has been there, but it hasn't always landed. And, um, and again, that's humor in general, but the fact that they gave much fewer opportunities uh, uh, a lot less opportunities in the prior episodes to be funny that it felt like the hit to miss ratio felt even worse when the number of tries was less. Uh, you know, that's how math works, I guess. Uh, but this one, it was a lot more comedy focused and there were some beats that did not work. I think uh, the buildup of Bordas being a terrible uh, the best man it worked a little bit, and but I don't think it really built up. Uh, I think the final payoff wasn't necessarily as funny as it could be because they kind of dragged it on a little too long. And also, uh, you know, at 
Isaac's bachelor party, you know, Bordas decides to sing, and they're in the simulator in a, uh, you know, 21st century Vegas lounge or whatever, but it's a very much a dead party at this point, and Bordas comes out in this, uh, in, you know, in an Elvis costume, um, and uh, the, the song, he, the Elvis song he chooses to sing badly, I believe it was Love Me Tender, and, you know, that's not a great, uh, the, I would have chosen, you know, uh, Burning Love or a Little Less Conversation, in my opinion, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's the joke, and if it just stayed there, and then he, uh, Gordon switched over to, or Isaac switched to Gordon after that, I think that would work, but then they just kept on going, and the toast, I think, while, yes, the joke, obviously, that he botches and he doesn't get the joke, the idea of, of good-natured ribbing at a best man toast, but that just went on so long, and I think the payoff was so weak that that joke in particular didn't work. However, the jokes that do work, work phenomenally. I love the fact that they finally pay off the sandwich that Gordon, uh, I think it was, what, episode seven, I think, when, you know, when the orphan got sent back in time, and they had the air nod vice, and Gordon uh, sent the sandwich um, uh, into the future three months because, like, hey, well, three months later, well, if I'm in a bad mood, I'm gonna have a sandwich, and it'll uh, brighten my day. And sure enough, it did. I love that they pay that off. Uh, I just wish they didn't, you know, have to spell that out immediately for that. They just kind of leave it uh, if they had left it a little bit more ambiguous and as a reward for those who've been following the whole time. That would have been funnier. But again, love the joke on that. Um, also, you know, Claire's bachelorette party, you have um, the simulated Isaac doing a magic mic uh, routine, and I'm like, oh, all right, that's uh, that's very much different, and clearly uh, 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 he, they're having fun on that uh, set as well. <laughs> and uh, But in my opinion, the best uh, beat in this episode is we get Halston Sage as Alara Katan back, uh, in the last, uh, after, at the wedding, in the final, I guess, five to ten minutes, and, I mean, I love Halton Stage. I don't, uh, I wish it, uh, she didn't have to leave the show, uh, you know, partway through season two, and that was a much-earned, uh, cameo appearance, and I just, I mean, she has to come back to the show. Come on. I love Tala, but, you know, Alara is where it's at, in my opinion, so... I mean, uh, some things that I noticed that made that seemed familiar to me in this last episode were um, obviously the beat of you know uh, a pre-warp civilization uh, sending a transmission asking for help is reminiscent of uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation's uh, pen pals, uh, as well as the Next Generation episode First Contact, where you have a uh, person in a pre-warp civilization who you know is a dreamer and. They can't stand to live in their society uh, anymore, and they get essentially taken uh, into the galaxy while the rest of the world um, is left to, to develop at their own pace. Very similar beats there. Um, but then also the beat about um, when Kelly is giving um, the uh, the history lesson to the saw uh, about the the early union that they just wanted to, you know, proselytize the, the good message of all this technology that helped them. They want to help others in the internet, interstellar community. Um, yeah, and, and, but then that ultimately devastating a planet um, may, uh, was reminiscent of a Star Trek Voyager episode, uh, Friendship One, where, you know, Earth sent out these probes with uh, warp technology and all this to make contact with other space-faring uh, life forms to reach out hand friendship a good intention message however the uh, it reached a society that was not ready for that level of technology and they destroyed themselves because of it um, yeah there's that beat as well so those are my main points of comparison uh, between this la uh, episode 10 and what came before I'll be doing my overall series uh, season three review uh, in another video, but for right now, I would say this was a uh, between episodes nine and ten. This is a good cap off of the season overall. And while uh, you know sneak preview of my season review, I think while this uh, the season was a little bit uneven, I wish that it was a little bit more. They could have injected a little bit more humor into some of the other episodes. I think this did a great job as a season overall, and I'm very pleased with what we got. I'm looking forward to more uh, Orville to come. So, what did you think 
of these last two episodes of the Orville New Horizons. Did you like them? Did you not like them? Uh, what about my analysis? Do you agree? Disagree? Did I miss anything? Let me know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate whatever audience I can get. Uh, again, uh, be sure to look for my season, my full season review of the Orville New Horizons coming soon. Uh, as well as my next movie review, which will be for Bullet Train, which comes out this weekend. And if you like this video or any other video on my channel, please give me a like, share, and especially subscribe. I would very much appreciate it. Again, thank you so much for watching. Just remember, there is nothing new under the sun. And yes, you have seen it before.